So normally for these videos, I have a sponsor. I have a lot of sponsors on the channel, and they're great. I typically only like sponsors on the channel that I myself can rightfully endorse. I don't really want to advertise some product that I don't know or I don't understand or don't necessarily like to begin with. Um, however, today's sponsor... <laughs> Holy crap, guys. I'm not exaggerating for this whatsoever. I really have not opened these and just opened them right now. Um, this video is sponsored by the Deck of Many, and they have these amazing, beautiful spell cards that are animated. Look at the Scorching Ray! Look at that! You can, imagine, imagine sitting around the table, and you whip this bad boy out, and you're like, I guess Scorching Ray, and everybody's like, holy crap! Uh, here's Invisibility. Uh, here, let me, let me hold it up. And you might be like, oh, well, they don't have, they don't have that many. You know, there's, a, there's a few in here. They, they can't possibly have nearly almost all the spells in the game. Um, here's a, here's, here's Sacred Flame. I, you know, I never knew what Sacred Flame looked like. I'm, I'm freaking out over these. <laughs> Spare the Dying is a pigeon. Little pigeon. And if you thought, yeah, you know, oh, there's not that many. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, here's, here's another one. Um, uh, here's, here's some more. This is, this is the deck of many things. These are so cool. I, I'm, I'm just absolutely... Go check out deckofmany.com and check out their animated spells. They are, these are incredible for the table. They're so immersive and they really bring a lot to the game. R big props to these guys for making these. These are just really cool, so go check it out. Anyways, uh, let's get into this video. Alright, so today, uh, we're going to be sitting on the floor and, uh, talking about homebrew rules, the ones that I use in my games. We do a little POV session here. Let's let's pretend you you have come over to my house and uh, we're gonna start playing D&D and I'm telling you all the rules. I'm your dungeon master. So, I mean, we all role play. We can pretend, right? Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. So you wanna play <laughs> Dungeons the Dragons? I can't do this. <laughs> oh god. We're gonna we're gonna go over all the rules that I put in my campaigns, and if you, I guess if you were a player in my game, this is all the rules that you would normally abide by. If you want to watch any of these games where I do that, you can go check it out on Arcane Arcade. You know what's a new homebrew thing I'm be adding? These fucking cards, guys. Holy shit! Alright, so uh, character creation rules. Typically, I don't like to be too strict on character creation, but most of these are from experience. I like to stick to raw as much as possible, but sometimes there's a rule that I just don't like or just doesn't work, and I just change it. So, um, I have reasons for all of them, so... Uh, I'll let you know what they are. Anyways, homebrew upon review or approval. I have had people use homebrew. I just want to be able to read it beforehand. And same thing goes for Unearthed Arcana. Sometimes it can be a little ridiculous, and it, or it doesn't fit into the setting of my game, and I just don't want it there. So that's always just up for approval. Any source book is fine. If it's from a book, it's okay. I don't care if you want to play a lizard folk shepherd druid. As long as it's from the books, then I consider it official, and I'll put it in the game. That's fine with me. For hit points, we don't do the average. I often find that the average tends tends to add a lot of hit points to characters, and I like there to be this kind of randomness to it. Um, I think it's more fun. And so, everybody rolls when they level up on their hit dice, and you ignore ones. That's, I stole that from Matthew Mercer, so if you roll a one, you get to re-roll it, and if you roll another one, you get to re-roll it. The minimum you can get is a two. Depending on the campaign, I often do level one racial feats from Xanathar's Guide. However, there can be races um, that don't have feats, so you can just pick one that fits the best. Or there's some homebrew ones that you can look up as well. Like, I might be able to spin Lucky for a Halfling, or Keen Mind for a Gnome, so uh, just depending on whatever you want. I always do vary in I know a lot of people don't like it, but I think that the current regular encumbrance for 5th edition is purely meant for the ease of pen and paper. However, most of my players use online tools like D&D Beyond to uh, manage their character stats, and if if we're doing that, I prefer variant encumbrance because it's much more a uh, gritty version of managing your character's inventory, and I think that there's a lot of fun to be had with, well, we can't carry this, what are we going to do with it? And variant encumbrance is just far more realistic when it comes to characters and whatnot. I just prefer it. It also gives a lot of use to bags of holding or characters with strength. I favor strength a lot. I defer to athletics over acrobatics more often than not because Dex has a very strong point in 5th edition armor class and initiative and dexterity saving throws which are really important. And strength is just kind of down there so carry weight is really important and I think it should be important and I want strength to be an important feat. So if your party's a bunch of little weaklings, consider playing a goliath. They'll, they can carry tree trunks on their backs. <laughs> No mystics. No mystics. 
No, no mystics. In short, I guess uh, they're just too powerful and unbalanced. Uh, no evil characters unless I know you're experienced in the game and can pull it off. Um, I have some people who are very experienced in Dungeons and Dragons and can very much pull off an evil character and um, have them care about the party and not be a murder hobo. Meanwhile, some people just want to play evil characters just to be evil, uh, which I don't prefer. If you're going to come to me with a character concept and be like, I'm evil, I would encourage you to play something a little bit more good. I don't mind if you're going to play somebody who's morally neutral, but somebody who... <laughs> just enjoys killing people or did evil things in their past and is looking to redeem themselves. I really like that. Uh, no secret characters. All the players get to know your race, class, and background. The characters may not know what their exact race, class, and background may be, but the players definitely get to know because I don't like having secret characters. Nobody's going to get to pretend to be a paladin when you're actually a warlock. I don't like that. I think it makes for terrible party compositions because if you come to the table and you don't know what everybody else is playing and you end up doubling up on characters, it can be kind of disheartening. Um, so beforehand we'd always do a session zero and everybody knows that everybody's playing and then you may work in your story with your characters however you like. Intelligence proficiency points. This is my own rule that I came up with because of my intelligence is dumb video. Effectively if you have an intelligence your intelligence modifier determines your skill points kind of like in the old editions. So if you have a modifier of three you get three new skill or tool proficiencies or languages. You may also use three of those points to gain expertise and it goes both ways. If you have a negative, you have an 8 in intelligence, you get to lose a proficiency. Um, and of course we use Milestone. <laughs> What's up? It's your boy, Milestones to level 3. <laughs> I also have an attunement rule. Um, I find the default attunement rules to be strange. Typically in Dungeons and Dragons, I don't like things that I, can, that I can't explain. I really like when the book gives me a way to explain how this thing works, mostly because I'm lazy and I'm not very imaginative and I like to have a picture in my head because I'm a very visual person. I don't like that attunement takes an hour. I know it does that for game mechanics, and I just don't understand it. Um, I guess it's so you can't do it in combat, or you have to spend time with the item, but I always run into the problem of how, what are you doing with the item? If it's just a rod, what are you doing? Poking every bit of it, staring at it? Like, wh what are you doing? Concentrating? Meditating? What about characters that don't know how to meditate? It's like, what does this even mean? So instead, I go, uh, I double down on the idea that it's a game mechanic, and uh, you may attune to an unattuned item as an action, and to unattune from an item, it takes 10 minutes. If a character is already attuned to an item and another character wants to attune to them, it's 10 minutes. Um, combat! Combat stuff. There, I have a lot of combat rules, actually, so... Flanking skill checks. This was my other video that I made called Flanking is Dumb, and I've implemented it, and I kind of like it. Sorry, Cody, I haven't been using a plus one modifier. Uh, maybe I should, but I don't want to swallow my pride. Instead, I do a flanking skill check. If you want to flank in my games, you can, though um, I require you to describe how you are flanking, and you must make a skill check that beats the armor class of the creature that you are flanking in order to succeed your advantage roll. I do this because I want players to be more creative and more descriptive with what they do in combat. I don't like the war gamey just, I go here, I attack, I roll dice. Uh, it's just not as fun to me. Uh, we don't use diagonals, the whole, like, five... It, it, it goes like 5, 15, 20, 30, it's, it, it scales up every other hex to be geometrically accurate, and we did run with it for a little while, and I really liked it, and then it just became really difficult. I prefer combat to be very quick and very fast-paced so that you can we can get on through each turn as quick as possible because it's combat, it's supposed to be fast. And this whole diagonal rule just made everything really complicated and we just, we just screwed it. Like, it, it's just too annoying to deal with. Uh, bloodied, if an NPC is below half hit points, I don't tell them their hit points, but I do tend to tell them when they're bloodied, which is about half health. Uh, massive damage, this is kind of a rule I made up. I, I don't really know if it's in the DM's guide. I, I've altered it heavily, I think. I don't know if it's in the DM's guide, you can call me out. But effectively, you have 80 hit points, let's say, and you take 40 damage from one attack. Um, and that can rack up to poisons, to magic, to anything. If you take half your health, you need to succeed a DC 15 constitution saving throw. Otherwise, you will take a massive damage uh, system shock roll. It's in the DM's guide, there's a little table, and they, they range from falling to zero hit points to not being able to take reactions. Uh, one of them's stunned, too, it's pretty bad. The way I always interpret it is as uh, in immense pain. It's just an immense amount of pain that you've taken all at once, and your character has to, like, struggle to hold on to do it. Um, I also do lingering injuries, and lingering injury happens if you take half your hit points, but you hit zero. So if you have 80 hit points, and you're at 40, and then you take 40 damage, you're at zero now, you have to make that con save, 
and if you fail, you take a lingering injury. And the way I always describe it is if it's, it's, if it's really bad, <laughs> um, the enemy basically like cuts off your arm as they drop you to zero, or they stab you in the eye. But I, I find that to be less of a um, harsher way to use massive damage, and it's just what happens when you take a fuck ton of damage. And, you know, that's what I think it should be. So another one that I really love, and my players have grown to really love, is the DM, me, often, uh, rolls death saving throws. Players do not see their death saving throws at all in my games. Um, I roll them behind the screen, and I do not fudge them because that would be awful. But what it does is it creates a massive sense of urgency in combat when a player goes down. That comes to their next turn. Imagine you're a player and your fighter has gone to zero hit points, and it comes to that fighter's turn, and you go, okay, roll a death saving throw. But the DM rolls it in secret. You have no idea if they've rolled a 1 or an 18. Um, the only way you'll really know is if they get a natural 20, because the natural 20 will bring them back to one hit point, so they'll just spontaneously come to life. But it really creates these amazing, unforgettable, tense situations in combat that I absolutely love. And it also creates panic. Uh, the cleric will just be like, ah, 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 and people will actually go to heal you because, um, well, you never know what you're at. You could be at three, you could be dead already. And by the time they get over to you and try to heal you, who knows if you're still alive. So I uh, recommend using that one. Players can also, if they don't have any healing, can go to unconscious um, allies and may roll medicine checks in order to uh, keep them alive. Though the medicine checks do not stabilize them, the medicine checks instead count as a death saving throw towards them. So if they roll below a 10, they fail and make it worse. And if they roll above a 10, then they give them a success. So that's one way the players can also kind of help uh, to keep uh, their buddies alive without necessarily being a healer. That's why you can also take the healer feat you can also get a medicine kit or have health potions. There's lots of ways that you can keep your buddies alive. Um, sprint. This is a rule from Pathfinder, I think, and Starfinder. On your turn, you sacrifice your entire turn. All your bonus, your bonus actions, your actions, your movement, your everything you can do. Not your reactions, but everything that you can do. Um, and you move in a straight line. It has to be straight line. And you move up to five times your speed. So if your speed is 30, you get to go 150 feet. All of the movement you make provokes opportunity attacks, and the opportunity attacks are at advantage. So it is not an ideal thing to use in combat while you're in the middle of a fight. It's more of a thing that you could use to catch up to the combat. This one has been really fun because it's so dumb to just be like, well, you'll get there in eight turns. And if you want to be real about it, all the speeds in D&D, if you just divide them by 10, are the miles per hour speed. Uh, so an average person could easily run 15 miles an hour, which is 150 feet in six seconds. So, uh, I mean... Yeah, uh, moving three miles an hour is like just like a just like a little jog. It's, it's nothing. So um, you, you can allow your players to run in combat if you want to, and I think it adds a lot more to the combat. It can make it a little bit more interesting. And also remember that the enemies can also run. So there's always that. Oh, yeah, and that also applies to my massive damage rule. The massive damage and the lingering injuries also apply to the um, NPCs in my game as well. Typically, I don't do it with, like, enemies that just die in one hit. It's like, okay, cut off his arm, who cares? But, um, like, big, big baddies or um, giant monsters or any kind of other people they're fighting, uh, they also take the, the lingering injuries and all that kind of stuff, because it's only fair. Cardic inspiration, that's, that's what I called it. We don't use inspiration in my games. What we do is complicated. I don't like default inspiration because I feel like it's just an advantage reroll that people don't even really ever use. So for a long time we used a, a bardic inspiration. So if you got inspiration, it was a d6, a d8, or a d10, depending on your level, that you got to add to your roll. Those are also forget it a lot. I also forgot to give them out to my players, so we've come with a new way we really, really, really like and we've been using for forever now. Is at the beginning of the game, or whenever I decide to award them, everybody gets a card from just a deck of cards and we have like these really big ones they're like they're like these giant like jumbo cards and I pass them out to all the players and they, they have a number on the back of them it's a deck of cards and what they get to do is they get to use that card and add it to any dice roll that they they want to before if I say they succeeded or failed of course but um, after they roll face cards are 10 2 through 10 is the number that is the number is the value and uh, an ace is a crit so if you get that ace you get a crit so it's pretty fun yeah it, it's pretty interesting because you never know what's behind the card and you always also always have it right in front of you so always remember that you have it and my players always get desperate for them they're just like oh we gotta use a card and it's been pretty fun so I, I recommend it okay spells I don't homebrew a whole lot of spells because I just like 
them. <laughs> I think most of the spells are very balanced. Some of them are a little ridiculous, but I mean, if you ever think a spell is ridiculous, double check if it's concentration, because it's not ridiculous anymore if you can just focus down the guy who's got concentration. <laughs> One spell I do change, and I, I know a lot of people change it, is Healing Spirit. It's from Xanathar's Guide, and the only thing I really change with it is that it must be used in combat. Don't have an in-game way to explain that. Maybe it's the fact that they, uh, if they're fighting or, or something like that, the spirit is like its own thing, and it kind of comes out of, of the ranger or druid casting it to heal their friends around them, but they can't use it outside of combat as a free 76 pool of health. But it can be used in combat as like a strategic little symbol of healing that you can do in the middle of fighting. All right, role playing. Uh, for role playing, I only have a few, one of them being uh, inciting players. You can incite other players if you want to, but I, I don't make them roll anything. I leave it up to that player. So if, for example, a player says, no, I don't want to go to the dungeon, and the barbarian goes, I'm going to roll insight, and rolls insight, I look at the player and go, it's up to you. Tell them what you think, depending on what they rolled, or don't say anything at all, because I leave it up to them. I'm not going to tell other players what another character is thinking. That's up to them, that's their role play. I don't want to take that away from them. Another thing is uh, deceiving players. Uh, you can roll deception against inciting players. That is always an option. If somebody's inciting, you can roll that deception to just be like, well, let's see if I get away with it. And if not, then the player can kind of DM it for themselves and be like, okay, you can tell I'm lying. Or I'm, you, you, you believe me, or, or something along the lines of that. I also don't really like Insight being a lie detector. I think that's a dumb way to use Insight. That's what Zone of Truth is for. So, anyways, I also often let players take narrative control sometimes. Normally, like Matthew Mercer does with a, how do you want to do this? Or sometimes I'll just look at a player and say, take narrative control of this situation. Basically, this, this comes up a lot in um, other games like, like Ten Candles or City of Mist or things like that. Basically, I kind of make them the DM for the moment. Just say, tell me what happens and you can control the situation, I'll let you do it. And it adds this kind of cool, like, cooperative storytelling, make-believe, fantasy, epic moments uh, of D&D that I think are really fun. So, DMs, don't be afraid to give your players a little bit of narrative control. You can always say no. Exploring! You cannot uh, take 20. <laughs> Sorry, Cody. <laughs> That's a, that's a rule from, from 3.5. I think it's dumb. I think it just takes away a lot of the challenge. The fact that you can just go to a place and just be like, ah, spend an hour and take 20. It's like, eh, that's dumb. You do have to roll, and you can re-roll depending on what it is. Um, more often than not, if it is a strength, dex, or constitution check, where you're trying to do something like lift a boulder or jump over a chasm. Okay, so my camera died, and I can't find the charger. So you guys get phone, Jacob. The amount of how unprofessional this channel is is staggering. Anyways, uh, what I was saying with rolling was uh, you can always re-roll strength, dexterity, and constitution checks, but when it comes to like intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, you only get like one shot. Um, especially with intelligence, because your character knows things, but they only get to try once on intelligence, and if they don't know it, then they haven't heard of it before, um, and they can always learn, so... That's how that works. The last two things, one of them being the help action. You can always help outside of combat, but in order to help somebody else, you have to be proficient in the skill already. So if you aren't proficient in, say, athletics, and you want to help somebody with it, uh, you can't give them advantage. And the last thing I use, um, and this is the only class thing that I change uh, because I hate it so much, and you all know what it is, is goddamn motherfucking piece of shit counter charm, which... It's an action, and anybody within 30 feet is no longer frightened or charmed. That's how it works. Paladins can do it. Bards can do it, too. I don't give a shit. Okay, guys, um, that's the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed this, and sorry for this dinky ending where I'm on my very shaky phone. <laughs> Go check out Animated Spells. Really cool. <laughs> and um, I feel like I'm in a vlog now. Later, guys. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, make sure to hit that like and subscribe. Oh, fuck. I hate this so much. That's the end of the video.